regular meeting number six will now come to order. Please stand for the playing of the national anthem. This evening, we are pleased to have Reverend Benji Adu Kumi from the Covenant Place Ministries Worldwide to pray with us. Pastor, welcome to council. While we are standing, let us bow down. I heard for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you and give you praise for such a wonderful day you've given to us. I thank you for this nation of America, this great state of Ohio, and this beautiful city of Columbus, and all the leaders that are here today, Lord, to do business for this city. Give them understanding, wisdom, knowledge, insight to be able to provide all the necessary input that the city needs. That the city will become one of the greatest cities in this state of America. We thank you that you will help us. We thank you that you will continue to lead us in all that we do and protect this city. We thank you and let everybody say amen. 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 Thank you so much, Pastor. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosade Padilla, De Al, Cower, Dorans, Favor Green, Remy White, President Harden. Any person who takes any actions to obstruct or interfere with the conduct of tonight's meeting may be charged with disturbing a lawful meeting pursuant to Columbus City Code 2317.12. Any person who enters those areas of city council chambers reserved for city officials or invited guests may be charged with criminal <coughs> trespass pursuant to Columbus City Code 2311.21. Can I get a motion to spend the reading of the journal? Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, De Al Cower, Dorans, Favor Green, Remy White, President Harden. Are there any additions or corrections to the journal? Hearing none, the journal is approved. This week's communication received by the city clerk's office are listed on the agenda and will be published in the city bulletin. Are there any other communications coming for the body? Not at this time. Thank you. We'll go around the dais uh, with announcements and resolutions from council members, starting with council member Bankston. Uh, thank you, council president. Just uh, a reminder to everyone that the application uh, for Accelerate Columbus program is now live uh, and will remain open until all program spots are filled. Uh, just as a refresher, this program is a free city funded small business training program focused on the topics uh, such as marketing, website development, and small business growth uh, for all of our entrepreneurs and small businesses in the city. This year's program will have 10 sub programs that small business owners and entrepreneurs can choose from. Uh, to see the full list of these organizations, please visit the city's uh, website at columbus.gov slash accelerate. And the application can be found on the city's uh, small biz hub at uh, cbussmallbizhub.com. It can also be found also on my office's social media channels. And so really looking forward to seeing the work that will be done this year through Accelerate Columbus. That's all I have. Nothing for me this evening. Thank you. Councilmember Dalecar. Nothing for me. Thank you. Uh, President Tim. Nothing for me. All right. Councilmember Favor. Thank you, Council President Harden. On Wednesday, January 24th, the Ohio Senate voted to override Governor DeWine's veto of legislation to restrict municipalities' ability to regulate tobacco within its boundaries. This preemption legislation will go into effect 90 days from the date of its passage. After that date, Previous ordinances passed by this council will no longer be in effect. 
including the flavored tobacco sales ban my colleagues and I unanimously passed in December 2022. Given the complexities and changing nature of this situation, I would like to invite Assistant Health Commissioner Anita Clark from Columbus Public Health to share more about what this means for Columbus businesses. Ms. Clark. Good evening. Uh, thank you so much, President Hardin, Chair Favor, other members of council. Again, we are just so disappointed um, in, this, uh, in the Senate's decision uh, to veto um, the ban on flavored tobacco. We're going to continue to do this great work for 85 more days, and we'll be working with the city attorney's office for other options. But we believe in this work for our youth and also people of color. It's important for the health of our community. Thank you, Ms. Clark. And if I heard you correctly, uh, you did say that there um, could be some movement that could happen from the city attorney's office. So we will continue to make sure we uh, keep the residents informed about uh, any pertinent information as it unfolds. Thank you. Thank you, Council President Harden. Thank you, Councilmember Favor. Councilmember Green. Thank you, President Harden. Um, I only have one resolution for this evening, and at this time, I'd like to invite uh, Marion Dancy and uh, Brienne Ballard uh, to the podium as I introduce it. Uh, resolution uh, 0015X-2024 to recognize the American Heart Association's centennial anniversary and to support the recognition of Friday, February 2nd, 2024 as National Wear Red Day and February as American Heart Month. For nearly 100 years, the American Heart Association has been fighting heart disease and stroke and helping families and communities thrive. With over 35 million volunteers and supporters, this organization has rapidly grown in size and influence. The American Heart Association strives to remove barriers through work in communities, scientific research, and advocating for health policies. And they have proudly named their 2024 goal as champion, championing health equity for all, where they will work to eliminate barriers of social determinants of health, structural racism, and threats to rural health. Cardiovascular disease continues to be the leading cause of death in the United States and is the leading cause of death in women. In recognition of the importance of the ongoing fight against heart disease and stroke, this council proclaims Friday, February 2nd, 2024 as National Wear Red Day. We urge Columbus residents to show their support for women and the fight against heart disease by commemorating this day and wearing the color red. By increasing awareness, Speaking out about heart disease and empowering women to reduce their risk for cardiovascular diseases, we can save thousands of lives this year. Um, our colleagues here on council and I are pleased to honor the American Heart Association as they celebrate their centennial anniversary. That is 100 years. That is a long time um, of doing this incredible work in the community. And so I would now like to turn the floor over to Brienne and Marion to share a few words on behalf of the American Heart Association. Well, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Green, Council President Hardin, and all the members of Council for recognizing February 2nd, 2024 as National Wear Red Day in the city of Columbus. As Council Member Green said, cardiovascular disease continues to be the number one killer of women, claiming more lives than all forms of cancer combined. Despite this staggering statistic, less than half of all women are aware that heart disease is their greatest health threat making raising awareness through American Heart Month, National Wear Red Day, more important than ever. Since 2004, Go, Go Red for Women has addressed the awareness and clinical care gaps of the number one killer of women. As Go Red celebrates 20 years this year of making an impact on the cusp of our 100th year, we continue to make bold moves to save lives and pioneer scientific discoveries. For two decades, we've been saving and improving women's lives by advancing equitable research and care, advocating for inclusive health policies, and raising awareness. But we haven't done it alone. We reach our goals by working with organizations and individuals who share our vision for better health. And today, the Go Red for Women community is stronger than ever. With that, it's my honor to introduce local heart survivor, Marian Dancy, to share her story. Thank you. Good evening, um, Good evening. President Hardin, uh, Council Member Green, and members of Council. I'm Marian Dancy. I just want to take a little bit of time to share my personal health journey. Um, in 2019, I had to advocate for my own health. I was 35 years old a busy mom and a career woman, and I was six and a half months postpartum. 
After cons um, having c concerning symptoms, I went on a series of four appointments with four different medical professionals. At the first appointment, I heard, you're young and healthy, let's just keep an eye on your symptoms. I kept an eye on it, it became worse. I made a second appointment where I heard, um, <laughs> there's no concerning history, uh, keep an eye on it, there's a little virus going around, it should pass. It didn't pass. My symptoms became worse, and then I went to the ER. And at the ER, I received, unfortunately, a misdiagnosis. So finally, after weeks of my initial onset of symptoms, I made a desperate attempt at a fourth appointment. I was told at that appointment that I was in heart failure. The diagnosis was peripartum cardiomyopathy, my heart condition caused by my pregnancy over six and a half months prior. So with my diagnosis in hand, I began my journey to recovery, and today I stand before you a much healthier woman, and I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful to the American Heart Association for all that they do to support and raise awareness for women like me. I am so thankful to be a survivor. Heart disease, as they mentioned, is the number one killer of women. It can affect women at any age, stage, or walk of life. I am especially thankful for the education that I've received while volunteering with the American Heart Association. That education also saved my mother's life. She is now a survivor. Just two weeks ago, I received a phone call and I realized right away from what I learned that she was experiencing a stroke. This is why awareness is so important. I am so thankful to acknowledge Friday, February 2nd as National Wear Red Day. I thank you to the city of Columbus um, as we gear up for Heart Month. Spreading the word, you're making a difference. You're making a difference for women like me and like my mother and also in the lives of the women that you love. So with my deepest gratitude and from the bottom of my heart, I thank you all. Thank you. Oh, oh, here, I'm going to come and present this to you. Does anyone else have any comments or questions? Um, I just wanted to say thank you for sharing your story uh, with us uh, this evening. As I um, often say, when we share our story, uh, we give others permission to do the same, uh, to educate themselves, arm themselves, um, and in the case of your mother, uh, prepare her. Uh, for what was coming down the pipeline, but through this education and your advocacy, uh, just incredibly grateful that you were there to support her and that your impact is going to speak dividends on others' lives. So thank you for, for doing that work uh, on behalf of the greater community. Any other questions or comments? Uh, seeing none, I move for adoption. Second. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, de Alcower, Dorans, Faber Green, Remy White, President Harden. Thank you, Councilmember Green, Councilmember Remy, Councilmember White. All right. Um, well, then. Um, I have one uh, resolution, but before I read my resolution, just want to, uh, this will be the first time, but we will continue to remind folks that um, starting at the end of the week is Black History Month, and Council's really excited to host our Black History Celebration this year on February 16th at the Lincoln Theater. And so we would love to have the community come out, participate, as we honor um, and recognize uh, uh, folks in our community who have made impacts uh, in terms of arts in our community as we celebrate Black History Month uh, in Columbus. So more to come uh, as we spread the word and announce who our uh, Jane Preston Poindexter award winners are very soon. So thank you. Uh, I have the honor of presenting a resolution to a friend, a, a family, someone who has done so much in our community our, in our, for our city. Uh, I'm going to read a resolution uh, commending Brenda Fields for her distinguished career to celebrate her retirement from the city of Columbus. Brenda, will you come forward? 
So we are here to honor the retirement of Ms. Brenda Fields, who has worked for uh, over 30 years for the city of Columbus. She served as education program supervisor with the city's Capital Kids program. She has been involved on numerous boards, committees, and organizations, including After School Counts, United Way, Columbus City Schools, the United State, uh, Ohio State University, the United Negro College Fund Walkathon, and the Epilepsy Foundation. She's also been a proud member of Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and a motivational speaker throughout her career. Um, anybody who knows Ms. Brenda knows that the kids are her passion, um, that she didn't do it for a paycheck all those 30 years, but she did it for the kids, specifically on the west side of Columbus, um, who uh, made it to her center. Um, uh, and um, every time um, that, that we would go over there, it was Miss B, Miss B, Miss B. Um, she had a, a, a she, she in, in over 30 years, you get to see families come through the center and you gave that to our community. And so on behalf of a grateful community, we couldn't let you just retire without, uh, without this type of recognition for all that you've done for our young people in, in this city. Um, so thank you so much. Um, are there any comments from my colleagues before I turn it over to um, Ms. B, to Ms. Rinda? I don't know if director wants to say anything. Uh. Thank you, President Harden, other council members. Uh, Ms. B, what, what can you say about a woman who uh, keeps so many young people in check? <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, I, and I literally say that, but when you're known at the school as well as in the community yeah. um, and amongst your peers, that means a lot. Um, I think when you, your last day, I was not in town, but um, very, very grateful for this moment. Um, it's very appreciative when someone works a length of period, especially with young people. So from recreation and parks, we say thank you. From this community, we say thank you. Um, we know that we can't replace you, but we'll look for someone else that spends a little time because you spent much. So thank you. Thank you. With that, I'm going to turn the podium over to you, Ms. V. Just take care of the babies, y'all. They need you. They need you. They need you. It's not my child, not my problem, because there are problems. They need you. You are the difference in yes or no. You are the difference to save a life. Your words, your kindness, just one time, just one time will save a life. Education, education. I'm obsessed with it. These kids mean the world to me. Their families mean the world to me. If you want to be a legacy, be the difference in their life. And believe me, somebody's watching you, and they will remember what you did. And they will remember what you said. And they will remember your kindness. And they will also remember your toughness, because Ms. B did not play, but I gave him a whole lot of love. <laughs> be the difference. Just love on them. That's all I can ask you, because God's not through with me yet, because I still got some more to do. But yes. God's not through. Be the difference. These babies need you. Please, please need these babies. Thank you so much. It is so, yes, council member. I just wanted to say we have not had the pleasure, but your reputation precedes you. And I think that it's very telling that on the day when you're here for us to honor you, all of your words just centered around what has been your legacy and leaving us with, in Spanish, there's a, there, there's a term called consejos. This is like the wisdom that I have to bestow upon you and the consejo you're leaving us with today is a word about how we need to continue to take care of our young people. And so I think that's a true testament to your career, to your life's work. And certainly I know that it's not over, but thank you for sharing that with us today. And thank you for that reminder. And thank you for your service to our community and for all the people of you have poured into the garden of hope, the garden of prosperity, the garden of something else is something that we continue to sow together as a community. So thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I move for adoption. Clerk, please call the roll. Bangston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcower, Doran's favor, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Are there any comments from our elected officials, the auditor, city attorney's office, treasurer? 
At this time, I request the following uh, ordinance be removed from the consent action portion of the agenda. In the Finance and Government Committee, we have Ordinance 0269-2024. Are there any other requests by members of council to remove a uh, ordinance from the re or resolution from the consent portion of the agenda? Hearing none, may we now have a motion to waive reading of the titles of 30-day legislation by the clerk? Clerk, please call the roll. Banks in, Barossa de Padilla, Dayal, Cowher, Dorans, Favor, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, do we have any reader, uh, speakers on the first? We don't have any speakers on the first reading. The following ordinance appear on our agenda as consent action. I apologize. Uh, Will the clerk now read to the record ordinance numbers of 30-day legislation? Finance and Governance Committee, ordinances 162-226-236-251-2024. Neighborhoods, Recreation, and Parks Committee, ordinances 126 and 132-2024. Public Safety and Criminal Justice Committee, ordinance 260-2024. Public Utilities and Sustainability Committee, Ordinances 115, 125, 136, 155, 157, and 165 2024. Zoning Committee, Ordinances 266 and 284 2024. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Um, the following ordinance appear on our agenda as consent action. Will the clerk now read those into the record? Resolutions of Expression 14X, 16X, 17X. 13X-2024, Finance and Governance Committee, Ordinances 18, 118, 186, and 319-2024, Economic Development and Small and Minority Business Committee, Ordinances, excuse me, one ordinance, 154-2024, Public Service and Transportation Committee, Ordinances 91, 149, 179, 201, 258-2024, Neighborhoods, Recreation, and Parks Committee, Ordinances 127, 129, 148-2024. Workforce, Education, and Labor Committee. Ordinances 3 and 198-2024. Housing, Homelessness, and Building Committee. Ordinances 200 and 216-2024. Health, Human Services, and Equity Committee. Ordinances 2, 84 and 206-2024, Public Safety and Criminal Justice Committee, Ordinances 117 and 189-2024, Public Utilities and Sustainability Committee, Ordinances 65, 72, 77, 134, 138, 139, 153-2024, and the Rules and Rough, uh, excuse me, Rules and Policy Committee, we have appointments 175-2023 and numbers 28, 29, 30, and 38-2024. Thank you, Madam Clerk. Are there any questions or comments on the consent portion of the agenda? Hearing none, may I have a motion to approve of these items? The clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Consent agenda items are passed. We'll now proceed with the second reading of 30 day tabled and emergency legislation. The first committee to come before council is the Finance Committee, chaired by Councilmember Bankston. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Um, I'm going to jump to page six of the agenda to read an ordinance in the Finance and Governance Committee this evening. Uh, tonight is the Finance and Governance Committee. For second read, we have Ordinance 0269-2024 to authorize the Director of the Department of Finance and Management to execute those documents necessary to release public airport use restrictions on three parcels of real property at John Glenn Columbus International Airport and to declare an emergency. At this time, I would move to refer this ordinance back to committee. Okay. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Dorans, Favor Green, Remy White, President Harden. Refer back to committee. Thank you, Council President. That's all I have in my committee this evening. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. The next committee to come before Council is the Public Service and Transportation Committee. That committee is chaired by Councilmember Rosa de Padilla. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. I have one ordinance today in Public Service and Transportation. <clears throat> Excuse me, Ordinance 3556-2023 to authorize the transfer of funds between the Northwest Corridor Pay as We Grow Fund and the Northeast Corridor Pay as We Grow Fund to authorize the transfer of funds within the Northeast Corridor Pay as We Grow Fund to appropriate funds within the Northwest Corridor Pay as We Grow Fund and Northeast Corridor Pay as We Grow Fund to authorize the Director of Public Service to enter into a contract 
contract modification with American Structure Point in connection with the ASR Hamilton Road from State Route 161 to Central College Road project to authorize the expenditure of up to $1,400,000 from the Northeast Corridor Pay As We Grow Fund for the project. So the intent of this contract is to provide the City of Columbus with traffic analysis, preliminary engineering documents, and detailed design plans for improvement, which will include reconstruction and widening um, of the road. Additionally, the installation of new curb, sidewalks, shared use path, storm sewer, street lighting, street trees and traffic signals along Hamilton Road from 161 to Central College Road. Improvements also include modifications to the eastern interchange ramps at 161, capacity improvements to Hamilton Road through the interchange, and installation of pedestrian and bicycle facilities along the East Dublin Granville Road intersection. So <clears throat> I just wanted to take a moment because we've read a couple pieces of legislation along the Hamilton Road corridor. So I just wanted to hand over to uh, Deputy Director uh, Borntrager. Can you just give us an update on Hamilton Road? Because this, is, this project is actually going from north to east and in various phases. So could you just give us a, what folks can expect? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, thank you, President Hardin and Chair Barista de Padilla, members of council. Um, as you know, we've had several projects um, that could be considered one uh, big project along Hamilton. This should be the third and final piece of that completion. Um, we are um, adding a variety of safety and, and Vision Zero um, uh, uh, additions to the roadway to make it safer and, and better for all users to, and separating road users as well. The, um, this will be to um, the final design modification that should be able to bring this into completion and construction uh, at some point in the future as we look for a variety of different funds to, to complete the project. But we're very excited about it and, and think it's going to um, be an additive benefit for the community. Thank you, Assistant Director. I just wanted to highlight it for folks because I think as we continue to give these pieces of legislation, you know, they're timed out differently. People are seeing the effects on the roads as they're experiencing them. We, we have a couple other projects that are still like in play. So I just wanted to make sure folks had questions, they could understand, they could understand the work that's being done. We are still in the design phase of the northern portion of Hamilton Road, have done the eastern portion of Hamilton Road. And I'm excited that for all of these projects, we've added in shared use paths, we've added in um, sidewalks, ADA ramps, et cetera, to again ensure that our folks are safe, uh, no matter how they're traveling our city streets and sidewalks. So thank you. Uh, do my colleagues have any questions or comments? Seeing none, I move for passage. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcower, Doran's favorite green, Remy White, Prison Harden. Pass. Thank you. That's all for me this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next committee to come before council is the Neighborhoods, Recreation, and Parks Committee, uh, council, uh, chaired by Councilmember de Alcower. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Harden. Tonight, in Neighborhoods, Recreation, and Parks Committee, we have Ordinance 130 2024 to authorize the Director of the Recreation and Parks Department to apply for grant funding for the Federal Highway Administration Raise Grant Program for construction of the Linden Green Line Linear Park and to declare an emergency. The Rebuilding American Infrastructure with Sustainability and Equity, or RAISE, grant program is accepting applications for funding to implement critical transportation infrastructure improvements and community connectivity projects. If awarded, this RAISE grant funding will be used to construct a portion of the Linden Green Line Linear Park. I wanted to take a couple minutes this evening to talk about this project since this is the first time it has come across this new council. In October 23, the department acquired seven miles of an abandoned rail corridor in the Linden area with the intention of building a one-of-its-kind 58-acre linear park in one of the region's most underserved areas for parks and natural areas, the Linden Green Line. Here to talk more about this amazing project and the timeline for funding and implementation, we have Brad Westall, project manager for the department. Brad, the floor is yours. And, and it's our turn to have show and tell. We've got videos and pictures. <laughs> we have show and tell. Good evening, Council. Brad Westall, <laughs> Planning Manager of Recreation and Parks. It's nice to be with you to talk uh, for a few moments about a project that's going to mean a lot for Columbus, but especially the Linden community. Uh, the Linden Green Line project is a rail corridor 
that has lied obscurely derelict for many, many years, runs right through the heart, basically, along the Cleveland and Westerville Road uh, corridors. And uh, we're presenting a little tour here for you, right? This is show and tell. I'll take you on a tour as uh, our Google Earth flies north on the line. You can see it distinctly in the middle of your screen right there. As it goes along, it passes by 19 schools. There's the Linden STEM Academy. It passes by uh, uh, many churches, cultural hubs. Uh, there it goes past Westerville Road. It's moving right along. If only we could ride our bike or walk this uh, at this speed, we would be tremendous, uh, in tremendously good shape. Uh, again, the corridor continues north. You're going to see a little turn. There's Cleveland uh, 3C Highway. We go over Ennis Road, right? Still going. We're at mile five. You haven't reached it yet. And then we cross Morse Road, and we turn slightly east as we get to a, a well-known project we're working on called the Kilbourne Run Sports Park there on your left. Yes, it goes right through the heart of that uh, uh, developing park as we get ready to construct that. Minerva Park on your left. Again, Westerville Road on your right. We go under Route uh, 161, which is a very handy uh, piece of infrastructure already built and in place. And then we end at Cooper Road at the Alum Creek Trail uh, on a park that's also a large sports co complex in the north. So you just went seven miles in about one minute right there. Uh, you've set the record on that. Uh, basically, in your handouts, here's what you're going to read. When that um, rail corridor was abandoned 35 years ago, recreation and parks and the city did, didn't really have their hands on this. If you take seven miles long and you uh, times it by 80 feet wide, you come up with 58 acres. In an area that has very few parks, this matters because this linear park will not be done as a block in the middle of a built-out inner city neighborhood. It will become their linear park, not just a pathway. It will have um, small amenities that we'll strategically put along there, don't have fully designed out yet, things that could include small play spaces, family shelters, um, and a basketball court or two, um, certainly connectivity back and forth at over 40 access points that we know of right now, 40. That's one approximately every two blocks. Um, that kind of access makes for 131,000 people to have a chance to enjoy something that right now they have nothing uh, uh, at all to, to be there. So as we're developing this, we need money. We're here to ask you tonight to support a grant application to the federal government for it. That's the US uh, Department of Transportation. Uh, that, that ask is critical to have construction funds to do this. One year ago, almost to the day, this council passed a resolution to acquire this property. And now, here a year later, we come to ask your support to move ahead with federal funding. And uh, thank you very much. I know I've left out a lot of bits and pieces of this, but you can ask us and Director Reese any questions that you wish. We're here to uh, entertain any comments. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Brad. I am so excited about this project because in addition to being an amazing addition to our park system, this project will play an important role in expanding mobility opportunities for our citizens, connecting multiple neighborhoods and communities on the east and northeast side of the city. So fingers crossed that our friends in the federal government also see the life-changing value of this project and help us out. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Guess Nick? Um, I, I just want to, I don't want to belabor, but I just want to point out how amazing this is and also want to commend Brad and Recreation and Parks. Uh, I think what most folks don't realize is that at the center of some of our largest economic development neighborhood transformation projects has been Rec and Parks. It's been Brad and the folks like you that think innovatively to think about how do we not just see parks as an amenity, but truly as a part of our economic development strategy uh, for our neighborhoods, but in particular this project, I think that one of my proudest moments in my public service career is not even sitting in this dais. It was working with residents in Linden. Um, and I see Ms. Pegg here from the South Linden Area Commission. I always want to shout her out. Um, but this was a big piece of that. And one of the pillars of the uh, One Linden Plan is to connect the community. Because Linden in itself and where it sits geographically, although strategic, is also uh, excluded from a lot of other parts of our city. And so one, naming this the Linden 
Green Mile, even though it goes through so many other neighborhoods, I think reinforces uh, the city's commitment uh, that Linden is a part of the landscape of this city, but also the heartbeat of this city. And so I'm so excited of what this is going to do, uh, not only as far as uh, the great the, uh, uniqueness of it that we have not seen this in our city, but how it's going to really unlock, I think, the potential and opportunity uh, for a neighborhood like Linden and so many others along it. So thank you all again for this. I'm looking forward to it. And I'm going to call Congresswoman Beatty myself and ask her <laughs> to help lobby for this money. Uh, because one thing that we like more at council than passing dollars for transformative projects is we like free money. So we will uh, absolutely take this up. And I'm proud to support this. Um, and I just, yes, to everything council member Bankson just said, but also, I mean, anytime that we can give people space um, to be outside, especially a lot, first of all, seven miles is really long. <laughs> It's fabulous but, um, for it to but, be that long. Yes, and it's like going through the center of the community, but also that people can do it safely, that it's providing green spaces for our young people, that it's providing people an opportunity to exercise, to be outside. And I think taking this in the center of the communities, that this was space that wouldn't otherwise be used and that we're using it for good is just amazing. And anytime that we can put people safely on a bike or on a scooter or that they can walk with their families and they can be outside is always, always a good thing, especially for this stretch of the community, the way that we were innovative about using land. So um, congratulations to you and the department. I'm just speaking it into existence. I'm very excited about this. So thank you for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for the mm -hmm. show and tell. I'm always down for the show and tell. <laughs> Any other questions or comments? Just one question from me, actually. Um, are, are, there, uh, are there any lights or other sort of infrastructure that are planned along the seven-mile stretch? Yes, uh, to all of that. Uh, we were strategically looking at lighting, uh, access points again, uh, roadway crossings. Um, we cross almost 10 major streets there, which would I showed you Morris Road and Agler and all that. So we have a lot of um, what I'd call enhanced safety crossings that we need to do. And um, you know what? There's not always sidewalks in uh, touching this green line uh, within three or 400 feet either, either direction. That's going to be really important too. So yes, the amenities are highest on the list. There are no other questions, then I move for passage. Bankston, Barossa, De Padilla, De Ocala, Dorans, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Passed. Thank you, Brad. And, uh, thank you very much, Council. That's all we have for my committee this evening. Thank you. The next, uh, thank you, Council Member. Uh, the next committee to come before Council is the Workforce Education and Labor Committee, chaired by President Pro Tem. Council Member, floor is yours. Thank you, Council President. Time we have Ordinance 0182-2024 to authorize the Executive Director of the Mayor's Office of Education to enter into a nonprofit <clears throat> service contract with Future Ready 5 to implement a comprehensive prenatal to age 5 strategy for activities related to achievement of the Mayor's goal that every child in Columbus is ready for kindergarten and to authorize expenditure of $400,000 from the general funds. Uh, to meet this goal of having every child in Columbus be ready for kindergarten, the city must work in partnership with organizations like Future Ready 5 that are well positioned to assist the city with this effort. Future Ready 5 is a nonprofit organization focused on supporting prenatal to five approach to education to ensure the success of all of our children in the city of Columbus. Uh, this or organization was selected due to their prior experience and success in providing the same services in 2023. And I'd like to turn the floor, floor over to uh, the Office of Education Director, Matt Smido, to say a few words about this contract and sort of where we're at in sort of this process and invite the CEO of Future Ready 5, uh, Mario Borsa, to the podium as well to share remarks. Director? Uh, President Pro Tem Dorans, President Harden, members of council, thank you for your consideration of this ordinance this evening. As you mentioned, Future Ready Five is our partner in making sure all kids in Franklin County are ready for kindergarten. Um, a little bit ago, Miss B challenged us all to take care of our kids, to take care of our babies. That's exactly Future Ready Five's mission. And I'm, I hope Miss B is still here to hear their presentation because we also have show and tell. Um, uh, I don't know if Mario can go seven miles in a minute, but he'll try. <laughs> Thank you, Director. We'll see. And Mario, you want to introduce your colleague as well? Yes, absolutely. Good evening, President Pro Tem Dorans, President Hardin, members of the council. I 
appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I want to introduce my colleague here today. This is Nita Agrawal. She is our Vice President of Advancement and Community Relations. So we're just going to share a little bit about our organization, if we can, with you today and what we're working on. And uh, hopefully have some time if you'd like to ask us questions. We'll certainly um, love, to, love to do that. So it's a great opportunity for us. Uh, I don't know that we've ever had the opportunity to do this uh, with the council. So we're really happy to be here. Um, I just want to start by just telling you a little bit about who we are and what we're about. So our passion-driven mission and what we wake up every day excited about is making sure kids are ready for, for kindergarten. And so in our work, at the core of it is about building systems, elevating early childhood education, and inspiring advocacy. And that is, those are really the three bullet points we are working on in the next year or two as we go forward. So just a quick uh, share of our board members. Uh, as you can see here, the mayor is a member of our board, and we're excited that um, there's some membership from the city there uh, representing um, your interests and the interests of the people of Columbus, and so we're excited about that. Just a quick word about the kindergarten readiness crisis. I imagine all of you already know this, but I do think it's important to level set a little bit. And the first thing that I think is important, this is real data, the most recent data we have uh, as a city here, which is 65% of our residents in the county are not ready for kindergarten currently. 78% of our black children in the county are not currently ready for kindergarten. 85% of our Latino children in Franklin County are not ready for kindergarten. And the number is very similar for our new American families that move into this community as well. Needless to say, we have a significant crisis. Um, and so that is really what we wake up every day at Future Ready to tackle. I want to talk about our solution. So we, we kind of believe in starting with each individual child first and their individual personal needs. And so to that end, our action plan is about building a learning ecosystem where largely one doesn't exist right now in the zero to five space that supports each individual child and coordinates their work across the sector. And what that looks like is a couple different things. So I want to kind of talk about what building that means for us. So the first thing we are working on, and we actually have already accomplished this, we're excited about this, is we have established universal early learning assessments. And so we've gone with two major assessments, one that's targeted toward literacy that NCH also uses, which is great, and the other one that's more comprehensive for zero to five. And we can give these assessments to every child age zero to five within the county, ultimately, that matches up with standards that ultimately match up what they're going to be measured on in the kindergarten readiness assessment. So we have that part done. Uh, the second step, which is in progress right now, is building a collaborative software system. So we are working with Sure Impact to build a system that doesn't just get us on the data entry side, but more importantly, gets us also on the referral side. Right now, there are systems in Columbus that are great data entry systems or great referral systems, but we don't know of any that exist that have both the entry and the referral process. So we are working hard on that as we speak right now with Sure Impact to build that system. The third step is that we are providing each family with a proven and personalized literacy support. So once we have the results of the assessments, Ultimately, what we're able to do is on an individual basis work with families and children throughout the city and the community to identify the needs, prescribe interventions to help those, that child be successful, and to help them get ready for kindergarten. And the beauty of this is this is zero to five. So right now, we don't know how all of our children are in terms of their readiness until they enter kindergarten. And if you look at a lot of the research, it suggests that 90% of the human brain is largely developed by the age of five. And if we're not getting any real take on how our kids are doing until they're five, the truth is we are already way behind. And so we think bringing awareness and data to this issue will, that's a major step for us in the right direction. And then the second big step, you can't just stop there, is going to be actually acting to ensure that kids are learning at higher levels. And then we'll follow up after the interventions happen to make sure that they're actually working. And my hope is that in six months or a year, I can come back and talk to you and show you the data and show you exactly what interventions are working, what interventions are not working, and how we can continue to progress this work over time. Now, I know what you're thinking. To do this with the 80, 70,000 kids in the zero to five space within this county is a monumental task. And so we do understand we have to do build small and grow from there. So we are starting with a small pilot system here to build this system up with a small group of folks working in our preschools and a few community agencies, and ultimately uh, build it from there so we can grow it over time. And that's gonna be in five weeks. So our first assessment starts in March, and we're really excited about that work. 
The last thing I want to share with you that we're working on also is that we have a partnership with Franklin County RISE. And so our work this year, we are the organization that is facilitating that work for the county on behalf of the county. And this year we are offering 600 plus scholarships and up to $21,000 award for Step Up to Quality movement. So previous years, the award was not as great. And I think it, we struggled a little bit to get movement on that in the way we wanted to. So that was a significant change we made. This year with Franklin County Rise, the other thing that I think is important to note is, is the big theme is movement. So instead of awarding folks for being you know, a certain star quality, we're saying you're going to get awarded if you move from one star to the next. Uh, and then we're rewarding also for P new PSCC contracts and those who are open for non-traditional hours. That's really all I had to share. I, I have a lot more I could share, but we tried to nail it down. Some of you may have seen my presentation at 36 slides, but um, <laughs> I assure you that's just in case you have other questions and I can kind of go to those slides and check them out. But I, I want to end by just saying thank you. Uh, this partnership between the City of Columbus and Future Ready 5 has been significant. It's been a, a, a long partnership, and you all have um, hung with our organization for a long time, believing in what we can do. And I'm very excited to tell you that we are in the process right now of making some serious movement in this work. And I will promise that when we come back, you will have hard data on what interventions work with kids and what don't in our city with our children. And we will be moving that work forward, and it's going to be very exciting for us. So with that being said, I'll, I'll pause for any questions you all might have. Any uh, questions or comments from council members? Actually, I'd like to Pastor. offer a comment. Um, I used to pastor a church that had an early childhood education program that we had run for over 20 years. A decade ago, we were having conversations about the need for this very thing, and nobody could pull all that together. So it's exciting that after all this time, we have a team of people who's seeing those different elements and trying to pull them all together because this is desperately needed. So thank you for your work. Thank you. Uh, in the, any other just, uh, just council one, member? Yeah, just one quick question. Uh, my one question was around, so first of all, thank you for being here today. Um, and thank you for uh, the 36 slides was a seven mile version. We took the... <laughs> we took the quick route. We took the drone over that seven miles. But um, my question is just around when we looked at the uh, at the numbers of uh, children and how far they're behind, especially thinking about uh, new and emerging communities with immigrants, migrants, and refugees. Um, can you just very quickly just put a fine point on what does the outreach look like for them? Because obviously there's different strategies. There's, there could potentially be language barriers, et cetera. How are we accounting for that when we are doing the assessments? So one of the, well, I'm sorry, uh, council member, but also the, um, I apologize. So one of the things that we are uh, trying to work on right now is we are we're working closely with organizations that are connecting to those communities. So we, we recently built an interesting connection with FESTA who does some great work within mm -hmm. this community. And so that's an organization that we're connecting with right away, and we're hoping that they're gonna be one of these pilot sites that we work with uh, right off the bat, and Onita's in lots of conversation with them about that. Um, in addition, we're in the process of hiring three staff members for our RISE program, and we are really doggedly determined to ensure one of them is bilingual and uh, speaks specifically Spanish so that we can connect with that population. We know that's our largest uh, second language here within the community, and it's gonna be super important. There are many preschools that we work with now that um, the primary language is Spanish in that school, and a few where the primary language of the staff is Spanish within that school. And so we believe if we're gonna make a difference, in, in especially in the uh, Latino community and the immigrant community in general, we, we need to really meet them where they are and that to me is critical. Do you have anything you'd like to add? Just um, uh, thank you so much, um, Council Member Barroso de Padilla. I want to add, not only is language part of it, but making sure that our interventions are culturally appropriate mm -hmm. and um, they are meaningful. So we don't know exactly what that looks like, but we have some strong commitments from a couple of organizations, also the Ethiopian Taiwanda Social Services, mm -hmm. who have been looking for this type of um, connection. And so although we know that translation is not the only thing that we can do, because that, does, that may not mean it, mm -hmm. but we're looking to make sure that our interventions are meaningful and culturally appropriate. Thank you. And one, one more piece, I think. So we have a uh, ECAC, our, our council, and we have a, a core group, which would Council on Racial Equity, 
and a data oversight council. We are also ensuring that those groups all have a much more diverse representation of this community. And in fact, we are uh, adding members from throughout our community to make it really representative of the people. So we've done, a, I think, a pretty good job. Nita's actually in charge of that over the past two months. And so that's making a change. And that representation, I think, exists now in a way that maybe it hasn't before as much. No, I appreciate that. I just wanted to uh, elevate that because I think that that nuance is, is critically important because I think with some of the efforts that we've tried in the past, we haven't necessarily baked that in. And so we know that we're leaving children and families behind unless we take a very intentional approach. So I appreciate you answering that question. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other question or comments from council members? Well, thank you both for being here. I look forward to, again, continuing this discussion as uh, more of the data comes in. I just want to say, it, it sincerely appreciate when we're talking about taking a very specific approach to the children that will be impacted by this rather than it's really easy in education to have a one-size-fits-all solution for every child, for every neighborhood, for every zip code. And this is the opposite of that, trying to be very targeted towards you know, those individual children. And I think that's something that uh, we're hopeful will be you know, bear the fruits of, uh, you know, everyone's work on this. So th thank you for the work and thank you for being here tonight. Uh, and with that, uh, if there are no other questions or comments, I move for passage. Second. Bangston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Doran's favorite green, Remy White, President Harden. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Council President. That's all I have my committees this evening. Next committee coming for Council is the Health and Human Service and Equity Committee, chaired by Councilmember Green. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, President Harden. Tonight in the Health, Human Services, and Equity Committee, we have one ordinance in second reading. It is Ordinance Number 0108-2024 to authorize the Board of Health to enter into a contract with The Ohio State University Physicians, Inc. for physician services for the Columbus Public Health Clinics for the period of February 1st, 2024 through January 31st, 2025 to waive competitive bidding requirements to authorize the expenditure of $62,400 from the Health Special Revenue Fund to pay the costs thereof and to declare an emergency. Uh, Columbus Public Health has a need to provide specialized physician services in order to effectively manage and meet the needs of their patients. This contract enables CPH to provide board certified infectious disease physician services across all divisions. This, special is, this specialized physician handles over 10,000 site visits annually and provides expert consultation for infectious disease, maternal child health, and emergency prepared preparedness and outbreak response. Not only does this provider collaborate with other practitioners at CPH, but they also serve as a technical resource and a community liaison, assisting with policy development, planning, and other coordination of services. In the absence of the health commissioner, the physician would serve as acting medical director and the department spokesperson. I don't have any show and tell to go along with this ordinance, but do any of my colleagues have uh, any questions? Seeing none, I move for passage. Okay. Clerk, please call the row. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Alcauer, Doran's favor, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Passed. Thank you, President Harden. That is all we have in this committee this evening. Thank you, Madam Chair. Next committee to come before council is the Public Safety and Criminal Justice Committee, chaired by Councilman Remy. Councilman, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Council President. Tonight I have two ordinances in Public Safety and Criminal Justice. The first ordinance is 168-2024 to authorize the Director of Public Safety to enter into a contract with UKG Kronos Systems for the Division of Fire for subscription software maintenance, support for telestaff, automated staffing software, and web staff subscription services to waive the competitive bidding provisions of the Columbus City Code to authorize the expenditure of $153,840 from the general fund and to declare an emergency. Deputy Director Holloran, could you please speak to the waiver of competitive bidding? Thank you, President Harden. Chair Remy, uh, this service is a web-based software solution that's designed specifically to help the Division of Fire manage its complex staffing assignments. Waiver is necessary here because the vendor is the proprietary owner of its contents, uh, and there's no other vendor that can provide these services for the division. Thank you very much, Deputy Director. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Bankston, Barosa de Padilla, de Al Cower, Doran's favorite green, Remy White, President Harden. 
Next, I have Ordinance 169, 2024, to authorize the Public Safety Director to enter into a contract with Target Solutions Learning, LLC, for computer-based distance learning services for the Division of Fire to authorize the expenditure of $175,648 from the general fund to waive the competitive bidding provisions of Columbus City Code and to declare an emergency. The Fire Division's distance learning project was implemented to provide remote training in all fire stations via computer network. A computer-based training content provider is used to continue to provide and implement training, scheduling, and logging of employee training history as Columbus Fire contracts with Target Solutions Learning LLC to deliver online fire and EMS continuing education under the parent company Vector Learning. Um, D Deputy Director Hollering, could you please speak to the waiver of competitive bidding on this particular piece of legislation? Yes, thank you, President Harden. Chair Remy, uh, the Division of Fire has successfully implemented uh, this specialized fire training software with Target Solutions over a period of time. Target Solutions is a proprietary owner of the contents uh, on this web-based solution, and it's not seeking to currently replace this long-standing relationship. Thank you very much, Deputy Director. Are there any questions or comments from my colleagues? Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, de Ocauer, Dorrance, Favor, Green, Remy, White, President Harden. Passed. Thank you, Council President. That is all I have this evening. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The final committee to come before council is the Public Utility and uh, Sustainability Committee, chaired by Councilmember White. Councilmember, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Harding. Tonight in Public Utilities and Sustainability Committee, we have one ordinance coming before council, and it's Ordinance 0133-2024 to authorize the Director of Public Utilities to establish a purchase order to make payments to Delaware County for sewer services provided during fiscal year 2024, and to authorize the expenditure of 4400000 from the Sanitary Sewer Operating Fund. Uh, this agreement has been in place since 1991 and helps the city avoid costly and duplicative wastewater treatment systems uh, for parts of Columbus. The increased cost is due to increased flow over the last two years, as well as additional rate increases. So I will stop there and see if there are any questions from my colleagues. Seeing none, I move for passage. Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Banks Din, Barossa de Padilla, de Ocauer, Dorrance, Faber, Green, Remy, White, President Horton. Passed. Thank you. That is all I have for my committee tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Seeing no further business to come before council, is there a motion to adjourn? Second. Clerk, please call the roll. Bankston, Barossa de Padilla, De Cower, Dorans, Favor Green, Remy White, President Harden. Meeting is adjourned, and, and we don't have a zoning tonight.